Hey everyone, welcome back to my channel. In this video, I will be providing you with the ultimate guide of all the schemes that are available here in England that help you purchase a property. Now, there are a lot of schemes available, so I will be giving a general overview of each scheme. However, for some of them, I have given separate videos on these that do go into a bit more detail, and I'll be sure to flag them in the cards as and when they come up. So be sure to click on those if you do want to dig a little bit deeper. Anywho, there is a lot to get through. So without further ado, I'm Kozan from Financial Madness, helping you be better with your money. So the first one up is something that I actually use to purchase my property, and that is the Lifetime ISA, or LISA for short. It is essentially a savings account that helps you either buy your first property or alternatively can be used as a pot to help fund for your retirement. Now for the sake of this video, I will be focusing on the home buying aspect of this scheme. Now you are limited in how much money you can put per year in your LISA account and it is capped at £4,000 per tax year. However, you do get the massive benefit of the government also contributing 25% of whatever you put into your account as a bonus. This means that if you manage to max out your contributions to £4,000 in one year, that means the government will add 25% as a bonus, which works out to be £1,000. So at the end of year one, you could be left with £5,000. The bonus is paid into your account until you reach the age of 50. And with a starting age of 18 years old, that means one individual can claim up to £33,000 in bonuses from the government. You don't necessarily need to hold your money as cash within a LISA account. You can, in fact, invest in stocks and shares. And because the Lifetime ISA is part of the ISA group, any gains that you do make from your stocks and shares is not subject to any capital gains tax whatsoever. Now, there is a word of caution. Any money that you do put into your LISA account, you are restricted if you do want to withdraw it. You can only withdraw it without any penalty if you fit any of the following scenarios. The first one being is that you are buying your first property, which is what we are focusing on this video. The second scenario is that you reach the age of 60 and you want to use it to fund a part of your retirement lifestyle. And the third one being is that you have been diagnosed as terminally ill with less than 12 months to live. Like I said, if you withdraw it for any other reason other than those, then you will be subject to a penalty. And that penalty works out to be 25% of your pot. Now, not only does this mean that you do lose the government bonuses that have been accumulated into your pot, but you also lose some of the capital that you actually put away yourself. So you do really need to make sure that if you are going to be opening up a LISA account, you will either use it for your first home or for your retirement. Now, the criteria for the Lifetime ISA, and I'll be doing the same thing for all of the schemes that I'm going to mention in this video. So the first one being is that for residents, um, it is available for anyone here in the UK. Um, it is only available if you are a first time buyer. It is also available for new and existing homes. There is a maximum price limit on the property that you can buy, and that maximum price is £450,000. And the last criteria is that you do need to have had the LISA account open for at least 12 months if you want to use it. Now, the first benefit is the most obvious one, and that is that you do get a 25% bonus from the government, and with the maximum bonus that you can get per tax year to being £1,000. The bonuses are paid into you monthly. So, for example, if I paid £2,000 in the month of October to my LISA account, I should expect that by November, I would have received the £500 bonus, that is 25% of £2,000, from the government in my LISA account. Another positive is that you can buy with another person, as long as that person is also a first-time buyer. Another positive is that even with a LISA account, you can still pay into other ISA accounts. So the LISA is part of the ISA family, and the LISA specifically is capped at £4,000 per tax year, but you are given a £20,000 ISA allowance. So if I manage to cap it at 4,000 with my LISA, that means I have 16,000 pounds left in my allowance to use on other ISA accounts, such as the cash ISA, stocks and shares ISA, and the innovative finance ISA. Now looking at the cons, and the first one being is that you are subject to a 25% penalty fee if you do withdraw your money for any other reason than your first home or retirement. And of course, if you are diagnosed terminally ill. Life, of course, does come with some unexpected surprises, and that could mean for us that we do need some instant access to cash. 
and having a large chunk of it locked away in a LISA account may not be ideal. And if you do have to withdraw it, that means you do lose the government bonus plus some of your own capital that you have put away initially. Now the last con is on the price cap when it comes to buying a property and that is price capped at £450,000. Now this may not be a lot for most people, however if you are living in an area like myself in London where property prices are extortionately high, you may find that the cap is actually quite restrictive and you may not be able to buy the property that you actually want. Now the next scheme available is the help to buy equity loan. Now this allows first time buyers help to get onto the property ladder with the assistance of the government in that they will lend home buyers in the form of an equity loan up to 20% if you are living outside of London and up to 40% within London of the purchase price of the property. This means the home buyer will only need to get a mortgage on the cost of the property minus the government loan and to add to that the buyer will only need to raise at least a 5% deposit towards their property. Now let's do a side by side comparison. For example, say there is a £400,000 house. Via the normal route, if you're getting a 5% deposit, this will set you back £20,000. Or what is more likely is that you'll actually have to raise a 10% to 15% mortgage for market value properties, although 5% are making their way back. That means that you'll need to raise at least £40,000 for a 10% deposit. Now under this scheme, if I was living in London, that means the government will be buying 40% of my property, which would be £160,000. So that means I only need to get a 5% deposit on the remaining balance, which would be £240,000. And therefore my deposit will be £12,000. But remember, you are taking out an equity loan, which does mean that you will have to pay the government back eventually. There is one good news is that the equity loans are interest-free for the first five years. That means if you are able to pay back the loan in full within those five years, you don't have to pay a single penny towards interest. However, after five years, you will then be charged interest and the starting rate of interest is 1.75%. And then every year after that, that interest rate will increase by the consumer price index rate, which is the normal uh, measure for inflation, plus 2% until that loan has been paid off. Let me just do a quick example because I know those numbers can seem a bit confusing. So for example, in year six, my starting interest rate will be at 1.75% and I'll be charged on that on the remaining balance of my equity loan. But then in year seven, that will then increase by the CPI rate plus 2%. Now let's assume the CPI rate is at 2%. So two plus two is 4%. So my interest rate will increase by 4%. And that means in year seven, my interest rate will be at 1.82%. Looking at the criteria, the help to buy equity loan is only available here in England, and it is only available for first time buyers. You are restricted to only purchasing new built properties. And when it comes to price caps, there are actually regional caps. So depending on where you're living and where you're wanting to buy, there is a price cap for that specific region. And one last thing to note is that this current model for the help to buy equity loan will be ending in April 2023. Now looking at the pros, the first one being is that you do require less capital to start off with to get your foot onto the property ladder. And this is obviously thanks to the equity loan, plus that you are likely to be able to secure a mortgage with just a 5% deposit. Another positive is that the equity loan is interest-free for the first five years. So as I already mentioned, if you do manage to pay off that equity loan within those first five years, you don't pay a single penny towards interest. And lastly, because the mortgage that you are getting will be considerably less thanks to the government equity loan, that means you're more likely to get access to better mortgage products than if you just went off yourself and looked at the market. Now looking at the cons, the first one being is that your loan does get increasingly more expensive the longer that you leave it unpaid. Now remember, after five years, your equity loan will begin to be charged interest. Now realistically, because the equity loan for most people will be very substantial, most people will be unlikely to pay off within the first five years because you remember, you still do have your bills to pay and a mortgage as well. Don't forget that it's not just the equity loan that you do have to pay back when you are living in a property. You do have other costs that you will need to consider. Now, because most people are unlikely to pay off their equity loan within the first five years, another option people tend to do is to sell off their property after year five and the money that you receive from that sale, you will then use to pay off the equity loan from the government. 
The second disadvantage is that this is an equity loan, with equity being the important keyword here. This means that the government have purchased a proportion or equity in your actual home. So using the example that I mentioned earlier, the government purchased 40% of my property and at that point in time, that was valued at 140,000 pounds. And then later on, the value of my property then increases. That means that 40% that the government own, that value has also increased. And whatever that has increased to, I will still have to pay back to the government. Now the third one on this list is the forces help to buy. Now this allows individuals to borrow up to 50% of their salary, although you are capped at borrowing up to 25,000 pounds. And this scheme is only available for service members who are either first time buyers or looking to move their primary residence. The loan can be used as part of the purchase price, such as legal costs, surveyor fees, etc etc or it can be used to make up part of your deposit looking at the criteria here this is available in the uk and it is only available to service members in the armed forces and they have to be either first-time buyers or moving property the current model of this scheme ends in december 2022 and other criteria of this scheme include that you have to have completed a prerequisite length of service have more than six months left to serve at the time of your application and meet the right medical categories. However, exceptions can be made for particular circumstances, so there is a bit of flexibility for those last three points. Looking at the pros for this scheme specifically is that you are able to use this scheme in conjunction with the main help to buy equity loan and also the shared ownership scheme, which I'll touch upon in my next point. Also, if you are buying with a partner, as long as you are eligible, you can both make use of the scheme towards your property. Another positive is that the loan that you have taken out is interest free for the first 10 years and you do pay back this loan in monthly installments. So again, if you do manage to pay back the loan in full within those first 10 years, then you don't pay a single penny on interest. Now, looking at the cons, the loans itself can seem quite limiting, especially if you are living in an area where property prices are quite high. Remember, you can only borrow up to 50% of your salary, but you are capped at £25,000. Now the fourth scheme available is the shared ownership scheme which is run by housing associations. Now the premise of this scheme is that you are able to purchase a proportion of your property. It currently ranges from 25 to 75%. However, the newer model for the shared ownership will see that drop to 10%. This means that you only need to get a mortgage on the proportion that you have purchased with the remaining shares of the property still being owned by the housing association. That means alongside with your mortgage repayments, you'll have to pay rent to the housing association because they still own that property in some shape or form. That means you don't need as much of a mortgage to get onto the property ladder, thus meaning that you're more likely to be able to afford the deposit. And therefore this is how the shared ownership scheme is supposed to help people get onto the property ladder. Now, I will give you an example of how the shared ownership scheme works because I can understand that it can seem a bit confusing at times. So let's look at an example. Say that the price of a property is at £400,000 and you purchase 35% of it and that works out to be £140,000. You manage to secure a 95% mortgage, which means you only need a 5% deposit and that works out to be £7,000. Here is just a typical example of what you can expect in your monthly repayment. Now I've got this example from LQ Homes and they use the exact same example that I mentioned earlier. So the price of the property is 400K and you've purchased 35%. Now your mortgage repayments per month would be 775 pounds and 50 pence. The rent to the housing association would be 595 pounds and 83 pence. And you do have to pay service charge because you are renting from the housing association and that works out to be 150 pounds per month. So your total monthly outgoings would be £1,521.33. Now, looking at the criteria for this, the Shared Ownership Scheme is only available in England and it is available to both first-time buyers and those looking to change their primary residence. Now, you are able to buy new build properties or existing properties that have been sold through the Shared Ownership Scheme. Now, although there is no specific price cap on the house price, like with the other examples that we went through, uh, with the shared ownership scheme, there is actually a limit to the household income 
uh, for those wanting to get involved in the scheme. So if you are living outside of London, you cannot be earning more than £80,000 if you want to be involved in the scheme. For those that are living in London, it's a little bit higher. You have to be earning as a household income £90,000 or less if you want to be involved in the scheme. Now, the last thing to note is that this current model of the shared ownership scheme will be ending in April 2026. Looking at the pros, now, much like the other schemes, this scheme is designed to make it a bit more affordable to get onto the property ladder. And it does so by making sure that you are only purchasing a smaller proportion of your property. That means you need a smaller mortgage and that means your deposit will be smaller as well. And because you are getting a smaller mortgage, that means you're more likely to get access to better mortgage deals that are available on the market compared to if you were to get a mortgage outright. You also have an option to buy more shares in your property through a method known as staircasing, and you can staircase all the way to 100% ownership, meaning that you will be eliminating the housing association from the entire process, and therefore you will no longer need to pay rent to them. Now, looking at the cons, the first one being is that you do have to pay 100% of the ground rent to the housing association, irrespective of how many shares that you own. So even if I own 60% of the property or 99% of the property, I will still be expected to pay for 100% of the ground rent or service charge. Another con is that all properties within this scheme are leaseholds, which means that you will never be able to own any of the land that your property sits on. However, you can organize some agreement with certain housing associations to ensure that you can purchase the freehold once you've staircased to 100%. However, this should be agreed before you purchase. So another con, and this is actually quite a big one, is that even if you are able to staircase to 100%, there is additional fees that will be incurred when you do so. So it's not simply just purchasing the value of those extra shares, you've got to pay for solicitor fees, uh, surveyor fees, etc, etc. And this does generally mean that staircasing is actually really expensive and it does make getting to that 100% really, really difficult for most people. However, the government have tried to address this in the newer model of the shared ownership scheme. And that means that if you do staircase at a rate of 1%, that means you will be incurring a lower cost of fees. However, if you staircase any more than 1%, then normal costs will apply. I do go into more detail about this in my video on the shared ownership scheme, so I'll put a link in the cards right now if you do want to check that out. And the last one is that you are free to decorate your home as you please. However, if you do want to make any structural changes to the building or any major home improvements, you will need to get permission from the housing association before you do so, as they still own the property. By the way, if you are enjoying this video so far, please be sure to like, comment, and subscribe with the notification bell on. I release a video every single week talking about all things personal finance with the ultimate aim of helping you be better with your money. Now moving on to scheme number five, which is shared ownership for people with long-term disabilities, or what is most commonly known as hold. Similar to the shared ownership scheme, if you are an individual with a long-term disability, you can actually take part in the hold scheme for properties in England. Again, the same concepts still apply. So you buy a proportion of your property while renting out the rest to the housing association. Now the proportion is from 10 to 75%, which is slightly different to the older model uh, of the shared ownership scheme. And the rent that you do pay to the housing association is subsidized. However, the main difference from the scheme is that if you are unable to find a property that meets your needs, you are potentially able to go onto the market to find your property. Although this is fully dependent on the participating housing association or registered provider. Now looking at the criteria on this one is that you do actually have to reside in England and it is only applicable to those with long-term physical or mental disabilities, cognitive or sensory impairments or enduring mental health issues. Now again, you do have to be a first time buyer or moving your main residence. Now you are able to purchase new build properties or existing homes that are resold through this scheme. And like with the shared ownership scheme, the household earnings limit still applies. So it's 80K for households outside of London and within London it is 90K. And lastly, the current model end date for this scheme is April 2026. Looking at the pros, so essentially it's got the same benefits as the shared ownership scheme, so I'm not gonna repeat myself. Um, but it also allows for a personalized environment for the individual purchasing property. 
The individual is also given the choice if they want to live alone or with other people. Now, looking at the cons, unfortunately, the availability of the providers offering on the whole scheme is limited and you are actually limited to particular locations within England itself as the scheme isn't offered very widely. The fifth one on this list is the Older People's Shared Ownership Scheme. So, like the name suggests, it is very similar to the Shared Ownership Scheme, but with its own minor tweaks. So the Opso Scheme is available for anyone aged 55 years or older who is looking to buy a property within the scheme. And again, the same concept applies. So you buy a proportion of the property while paying rent on the rest. You can purchase between 10 to 75% of your property while paying rent on the remaining shares to the housing association. Now, the major difference between the OPSO scheme and the normal shared ownership scheme is that you can never staircase to 100% ownership. The maximum ownership that you can get is 75%. But once you do reach 75%, you no longer pay rent to the housing association. Now, looking at the criteria for this one, so again, you do have to reside within England and you do have to be aged 55 or over and you have to either be a first time buyer or moving your primary residence to be eligible. You can purchase new build properties or existing properties that are resold within the scheme and the same earning limits apply as like the two examples before. So 80K is the limit of your household income for those living outside of London and 90K for those living within London. And lastly, the current model end date for this scheme is April 2023. Now looking at the pros on this one, so again, I'm not gonna repeat myself on the shared ownership pros, but pretty much they all apply here. Um, one specific to this scheme is that there is no need to staircase to 100% to stop paying rent to the housing association. So you can staircase to 75% and you will no longer need to pay rent on that. And obviously a second benefit is that the rent that you do pay to the housing association is subsidized. Now looking at the cons, now this may be blaringly obvious, but it is of course that you cannot exclude the housing association from this deal. Now this can prove to be a difficult catch, especially if you are looking to resell it or pass it down to your heirs. Now what this could mean is that, for example, if the owners do pass away unexpectedly uh, before they could sell the property on, that means the property cannot be passed on to their heirs, but the heirs will be able to sell it. But if they are unable to sell it immediately, they will have to continue to pay the rent to the housing association, assuming that they haven't reached the 75% ownership mark. Moving on to the next scheme, and this is the first home scheme. Now, this is one of the latest schemes on this list, and it was part of Boris's promise to try and change this generation rent to a generation buy. In gist, the scheme is meant to help first-time buyers and key workers get onto the property ladder by offering discounted housing. Now, these discounts can be up to 30% of the market price, with some councils able to go up to 50%. The discount does apply to the property for life. That means for the next generation of new buyers, they can still benefit from the discount every time the property has been sold. So let's look at an example here. Say we are buying a property and it is valued at £300,000 on the market. Under the first homes discount, you'll get a 30% discount. That means I only need to pay £210,000 for that property. Now, with the same example, but I want to sell that property and in a few years, the house has now been valued at £350,000. Again, this is the market value. If I want to sell it, I will have to do it with the first homes discount, because remember that discount does apply for life on that property. So that discount was 30%. So my sale price um, that I can get will be 245,000 pounds. Now looking at the criteria for this one, you do have to reside in England and it is only available to first time buyers. Now you are technically allowed to buy new build properties and existing homes, but by nature, with this being the initial round of houses being built under the scheme, the first lot of buyers will be buying new build properties only. There is a household earnings limit, much like the shared ownership scheme, and that means your household cannot earn more than £80,000 if you are living outside of London. If you are within London, then you cannot be earning more than £90,000 to be eligible for this scheme. There are also house price caps also involved, 
Again, there is a distinguishment between London and the rest of England. For the rest of England, the price cap is £250,000. And for those that are within London, it is at £420,000. So looking at the pros, the fact that you do get a discount of up to 30% or even in some cases up to 50%, that means you require a lot less capital to put your foot onto the property ladder. Another positive from this scheme is that this scheme really does try to prioritise first time buyers that have been living in the local area for some time or they are key workers, uh, part of the armed forces or veterans uh, over other applicants. And the last positive is that the stamp duty tax is based on the discounted price rather than the market value of the property. Looking at the cons, the first one being is that you'll have to actively find developers that are working with the first home scheme within your local area. And this leads on to the second con in that it is expected that competition is expected to be very, very high for this scheme. There is only plans to have 1,500 homes built under this scheme by the end of 2021 with a further 10,000 by 2022. And considering that there are over 300,000 first time buyers in the UK, you don't really need to be a math genius to see that it's not really gonna add up. Now the next scheme on this list is the right to buy scheme. Now this allows council tenants or housing association tenants get the right to buy their property at a discount. Now the discount that you can obtain can be up to 70% of the property value, but it is capped at £112,800 if you're living in London or £84,600 if you're living outside of London. The discount that you do get is dependent on a number of factors. For example, your years of tenancy, the type of property, and the market value of the property as well. Now, looking at the criteria on this one, so this scheme is available in England and in Northern Ireland. However, the Northern Ireland version is quite different to the England version in the fact that the discount that you can get is a lot smaller. Now, this can only be available for council tenants and the type of property that you are buying is your own property. So depending on what that is, uh, that is what you will be purchasing. Now, there is no earnings limit or price limits on this per se. However, there is some further criteria that you do need to be aware of, such as you have to have had a public sector landlord for three years. You should be a secure tenant and it should be self-contained. Again, I go into more detail about these criteria in my video on Right to Buy Explained. Looking at the pros, the first one being is that it gives the opportunity for those within social housing to get onto the property ladder. And with the discount applied, it makes it a bit more affordable to do so. The deposit that you will need for your mortgage to buy your property will be reduced thanks to the government discount. And there is no moving costs associated to uh, buying a property through Right to Buy because you are already living in it. Now, looking at the cons, there are certain time restrictions you do have to be aware of if you are looking to sell the property after you have purchased it. Now, given the time frame, you may be obliged to offer it to the housing association first before offering it to the market, or you may even be expected to pay some of that discount back. The ninth scheme available is something called the preserved right to buy. Now, this is very similar to the right to buy scheme, so I'm going to be very brief on this. But there are cases where secure council tenants, which just means that you have a tenancy with no time limits, were living in their home when the ownership of the property was transferred to another landlord, like a housing association. Because of this change of ownership, which essentially meant that you were no longer living in public housing, but rather private housing, it became easy to assume that right to buy was no longer applicable for those cases. That's where preserved right to buy comes in, which effectively means that if your ownership was changed during your period of living there, you may actually still have rights to buy the property with the same discounts as I mentioned in the previous scheme. If you are unsure if this is applicable to you, please do contact your landlord and they should be able to confirm this for you. The next on the list is right to acquire. Now this again, is quite similar to the last two schemes that I mentioned, but this right to acquire allows most housing association tenants the ability to buy their property at a discount. You can apply through the scheme if you have had a public sector landlord for at least three years, and the discount you will obtain will depend on where you live, but it will be between the ranges of 9,000 to 16,000 pounds. Looking at the criteria on this one, this is only applicable for residents in the UK, 
and you do have to be a housing association tenant with a public sector landlord for at least three years to be eligible. When it comes to the new and existing property argument, again, like right to buy, this doesn't really apply here because you are buying the property that you live in. And lastly, some other criteria that you should be aware of is that the property in question should have been built or bought by the Housing Association after the 31st of March 1997, or equally, it should have at least been transferred to them after the 31st of March 1997 as well. And the landlords themselves should be registered with the regulator of social housing. Now, the 11th one on this list is the Help to Build scheme. Now, this is actually a very new scheme that was actually announced by the government in April 2021. Unfortunately, there isn't actually specific details around about how this scheme is going to work. There was some suggestion that it was going to go live late in the summer, around about August, September time. However, September has passed now and I've looked online and it actually hasn't been much information since then. Um, there is suggestions that it will work slightly like a help to buy equity loan in the sense that the government will purchase some equity in your property and you will then have to go out and get a self-built mortgage, thus making it more affordable to get a self-built property. However, again, not much information has been announced on this topic, but I'll be sure to get a video out there once more information has become available. The top one on this list is something called discounted sales. Now this is actually probably one of the lesser known schemes that people are aware of that actually do happen in the UK. But basically housing associations and councils often build selected homes at a discount anyway. And these discounts typically range between 25 and 50%. And these are known as discounted sales. The councils or housing association will usually set the criteria themselves. So you will have to actively seek them out to find out if any are available and if any are applicable to you. If you are interested in this, it is suggested that you contact your local council in the area that you're interested in buying to see if there are any discounted homes available. Please note that not all councils or housing associations offer discounted sales, it's only a few. And last but not least is the mortgage guaranteed scheme. Now this was introduced by the government earlier this year and it doesn't really have much impact in terms of getting a normal mortgage on the consumer. It really just had an impact on the bank to try and encourage them to introduce more 95% mortgages onto the market. Now, if you remember earlier on in my video, I did mention that if you typically go onto the market, you would normally expect to get a deposit of between 10 to 15%. Now, before COVID-19 happened, there were 5% deposit mortgages available or 95% uh, mortgages. And yeah, because of COVID-19, banks became a bit more restrictive in how much they were lending out. So 95% mortgages were pretty much wiped off the shelves completely. And obviously that has made it really difficult for first time buyers or home movers even to try and get back onto the property ladder. And that is when the government decided to announce this 95% guaranteed mortgage for participating lenders. So basically they reached out to the lenders to say, hey, look, let's put the 95% mortgages back on the shelves. If the person that is borrowing the money somehow defaults on the loan, we will cover the costs for you. And now because the lenders do have that backing, 95% mortgages have become more widely available. However, there is a criteria and yeah, I'll just go through it now. So the criteria is that the residency has to be anywhere in the UK. It is applicable to first time buyers or anyone looking to change their primary residence and it is both applicable for new and existing homes. There is a maximum purchase limit on the property and that is at 600,000 pounds and the scheme is due to end in December, 2022. Now looking at the pros, the first one being is that the capital required to get a deposit is now considerably lower thanks to the 95% guaranteed mortgage scheme. And also once you do purchase a house through this mortgage, you actually own the house outright. There is no government equity loan to worry about or housing association involved in the process whatsoever, unlike some of the other schemes. And lastly, looking at the cons, you still do need to pass the lender's credibility checker to purchase a property. So for example, if a person wants to buy a 600K house, um, they might be thinking, oh, I just need a 5% deposit to get that house under this scheme, and that would be 30K. That's not the case. You do need to pass the credibility checker, as I've already mentioned, 
and this usually means that you can only borrow up to 4.5% your household income. So you may not still be able to get the housing that you do want with such a low deposit. So that is just something to think about. Oh, okay, that was a lot. Uh, hopefully I didn't bore you and I hopefully that was insightful. Please do let me know if you do have any further questions regarding any of the schemes. I know a lot of them, I've already done videos of them in the past, so if you do have any questions on those, I suggest you check them out. Uh, I've been putting cards throughout the video and I'll put all the links in the description box down below, but there are some that I haven't done videos on, so if you do have any of those uh, still to question, please do just drop me a comment down below and I'll be sure to get back to you. But yeah, but yeah, hopefully you found that insightful. I would really appreciate if you smash that like button that does wonders for the growth of my YouTube channel. And yeah, remember, I release a video every single week. So if you want to keep up to date with those, hit the subscribe button too. See you later. Bye.